welcome to the first book club session uh, with uh, Antil Inside. Uh, at Antil Inside, uh, I think a year ago we would like you know having very serious discussions about machine learning and AI and ethics, and suddenly you know. Uh, this year, with everything turned around, we said, well, why can't we talk about science fiction? Because that's actually what Antil Inside is about. And so um, I'm really glad that we have really started off uh, with, uh, with Gotham's book, uh, The Wall. Um, I think Gotham's very special for me personally, because we started this year of our uh, project on privacy and engineering by hosting Gotham in January. And then, of course, the pandemic took over. And now Gotham's back again. <laughs> Uh, you know, with a sort of doing a second cameo over here. So we're only going to see one side of Gotham today, which is a science fiction writer. And he claims that that is his original self. I'm not going to reveal more because there's a better person than me who's going to shepherd the session here today. And that's Vijaya. Um, I really want to thank Vijaya for taking charge. Uh, Vijaya is usually very um, humble about herself, but I'm sure you're going to see more of Vijaya and the other panelists in the next few months as they shepherd this uh, book club and, uh, and you know, have more exciting discussions and sessions for you. So Vijaya, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Please don't be very humble and <laughs> uh, take over the proceedings from here and hope all of us have fun. Uh, those of you who are watching on YouTube, you can post your questions in the comment section. We will take them here and then uh, Vijaya can queue them up uh, as we go along the way. Uh, over to you, Vijaya. Thank you, Zainab. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the inaugural session of the Antil Inside uh, Science Fiction Book Club, a reading and discussion of The Wall by Gautam Bhatia. Uh, first, to introduce myself, I'm Vijay Lakshmi. I have uh, uh, published a tiny little book called uh, Strangely Familiar Tales, and I write for Women's Web on uh, issues at the intersection of pop culture and feminism. And mostly, I'm just a very voracious reader. Um, a few things that I'd like to uh, everyone to keep in mind today before we begin is first to keep your mics on mute so that we can hear the panelists uh, clearly. And uh, secondly, uh, that, uh, you know, just keep typing your questions into the chat box as we progress, because we will be having a Q&A session later. So, uh, you know, at that point of time, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and you can ask uh, your questions. Um, let me start by introducing our panelists uh, today, uh, Krishna Uday Shankar, uh, T.G. Shenoy, and of course, uh, Gautam Bhatia. Uh, Krishna Uday Shankar is the author of the Aryavarta Chronicle series, Three, Immortal, Beast, and the poetry collection, <clears throat> Origin. She co-edited Body Boundaries, the Etiquette Anthology of Women's Writing. Her work has also been published in many print and online anthologies, such as Magical Women, 24 Flavors, and Lontar Number no. 6. She was one of the nominees for the Tata Book First Book Award 2012 and the 2016 Writer in Residence at Fort Canning National Park, Singapore. All her books to date have been optioned for movies or web series. Krishna holds a PhD in Strategic Management as well as an undergraduate degree in law. Apart from writing fiction, she is also the author of two textbooks, International Business, An Asian Perspective, and Global Business Today. In addition to her writing, she also currently leads Uncommon Ground, a Rohini Nilekani Philanthropies, CAMP Arbitration and Mediation Practice Initiative. All her books to date have been She is also the mother of three bookish canine children, Buzo, Zana, and Maya, who ghostwrite her books. T.G. Shanoi is an SFF enthusiast and a columnist and critic. He's the writer of India's longest running weekly SF column, New Worlds Weekly for Factor Daily, and the Specfix column for Bangalore Mirror. He also curates the SF track for Bangalore Lit Fest. He has featured in podcasts such as the Tale Harate, Kannada podcast, and events such as Sri Lanka Comic Con to talk about SFF in general and Indian SF in particular. He hosts To Boldly Go, a fun SFF quiz every Saturday. He is also an advertising and marketing professional and is currently a consulting partner with Celsius 100 Consulting. And finally, the star of the day, Gautam Bhatia, the author of The Wall and senior editor at the award-winning Strange Horizons magazine. He blogs about books and poetry at an enduring romantic. His work is also included in the upcoming second volume of the Golang's Anthology of South Asian Science Fiction and Fantasy. His other not-so-secret identity is that of a lawyer, 
an expert in constitutional law who has worked on important contemporary constitutional cases. Uh, his writing on constitutional law has appeared on platforms such as the Scroll, Outlook India, etc. He has also authored two books, Offend, Shock or Disturb, Free Speech Under the Indian Constitution, and The Transformative Constitution, A Radical Biography in Nine Acts. He would like you to know that the wall has nothing whatsoever to do with lawyering. Welcome, all of you. And um, Gautam, would you like to say anything before we begin? Oh, no, just, I, uh, I guess just uh, I'm really grateful for the fact that the first book that the Antel Science Fiction Book Club is discussing um, is The Wall. So I'm, I'm, I'm extremely, extremely honored and grateful. And it just strikes me that just yesterday I was, I was watching uh, a, a future con, you know, a science fiction convention online, yeah. the South Asia, the South Asia uh, session and, and the common lament that all the panelists had was that there exists no infrastructure to sustain science fiction writing in, in India and, and South Asia, unlike in Western countries. And I think that magazines, cons, and book clubs um, are exactly the kind of infrastructure that will allow science fiction to happen and for the reading public to kind of come into being and, and find itself. So that's the, I think this is a wonderful um, beginning and, and I hope that the Antil Inside Science Fiction Book Club has a long life uh, going forward and that hopefully this will be a propitious beginning to, beginning to that long life. Thank you so much. Um, Krishna, Shanoi, anything that you guys have to add before we begin? No, no, I mean, this this is really a, a great uh, platform and I, I hope it takes off and more people come in because one of the common refrains that you hear is that, uh, you know, I don't, didn't know Indian sci-fi existed. Or, you know, are there books written in this genre and all of those things. So, uh, given the fact that they are getting published and the publishers are not doing their bit it then falls upon us as uh, fans and readers you know or uh, enthusiasts of the genre to do a bit and in, uh, you know and uh, something like the Antil uh, SF book club will go a long way so in that sense I would like to thank Antil Hasgik and Zainab for setting this up and what better way to begin with uh, this. All right. Um, so just to get started, I'd like to start with you, Shanoi, uh, because you're such an encyclopedia on uh, all things uh, SFF. Um, now, India has always had a very rich tradition of SFF writing and storytelling. So it's not exactly new to us. But in recent times, there has been a lot of interest from domestic readers as well as international readers in uh, Indian SFF. Uh, so given that there is this surge, uh, would you say that this is a great time for the wall to be coming out? Uh, yes, I, I would say so. I mean, it's sort of right now, SFF in India is sort of peaking and one hopes that this peak keeps going on and on. But to uh, come back to somebody who said in the comments that Indian SF has you know, been there for a long time. Yes, it has been around for a long time. I mean, even if you accept the one school of thought that even... Uh, uh, you know, uh, any sort of fantastic literature falls under this ambit. We've had, you know, years of uh, of that genre. But even in the modern era, for example, there are lots of uh, stories in which uh, Indian F SFF has had landmarks. I mean, starting from uh, J.C. Bose's, you know, The Runaway Cyclone, which is the first uh, story anywhere in the world to uh, feature the literary use of the butterfly effect. Or uh, even if you take uh, the 1905 story by Begum Rukaya, you know, Sultana's Dream, yeah. which was probably among the first pieces of feminist SF uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you go by the, the, the Western histories, they'll tell you that it's 1915, you know, 15 with Charlotte Gilman Herland. But Rukaya's, uh, you know, uh, Ladyland came 10 years before that. So you've had a long history of that. And uh, so when I hear that... Uh, you know, there's, there's no SF in India or there's no sci-fi being written in India. It's mostly a case of, I don't know about these books. That, that Fundamentally, that's uh, where it comes from. But I have seen it changing over the past uh, three or four years. And, you know, uh, lots, I mean, uh, once upon a time, there will be like one stray book coming out every year, right? Uh, you know, for example, back when, uh, Samit Basu uh, wrote Simokin Prophecies, which is the first uh, Indian fantasy novel in English. Right? There was that one book. Then the next year, there was the second book in the trilogy. And uh, But in the past two or three years, there, there's been a sort of explosion 
you know be it in anthologies uh, or be it in the form of uh, novels uh, so to speak for example uh, we had uh, the magical women which is uh, an all women uh, feminist sf anthology uh, uh, you know edited by sukanya venkat raghavan uh, you know yeah krishna is one of the authors on that uh, so that that's the cover right there go get it it's, it's a gorgeous it's, book <laughs> Yeah, it, is. it is. It is. It is indeed a, a gorgeous book that spans the whole spectrum of uh, SF. By that, I mean speculative fiction. You know, science fiction, fantasy, and horror. And you know, there's a lot of you know some humorous writing also uh, uh, thrown in. Uh, and then uh, a landmark also was, of course, uh, Golands, which is one of the oldest SF publishers in the world, uh, deciding to have a South Asia. Uh, focused anthology, and that was you know I still remember the book when it came out. It that big yellow label and said Golands comes to India. So you know as much as we would like to think that uh, hey there are no readers or there are no as a fans. If somebody like a Golands is taking this uh, region seriously, it means that the, the profile is uh, uh, rising. Uh, then of course uh, you know uh, Beast came out. Again, by uh, Krishna Uday Shankar recently, um, uh, uh, Leela, you know, Prayag Akbar. So while yeah. many people would not consider it SF, I would consider it SF. Uh, you know, that came out, created some waves. You know, sort of bridged the SF literary thing. Got made into a Netflix documentary as well. Uh, I mean, Netflix series. I say doc. I mean, yeah. documentary slipped out because if you watch it, it sort of <laughs> feels like a fictionalized documentary of what is happening. Doesn't feel like it's speculative enough. but yeah so that so that happened i mean and uh, there was this anthology uh, called strange world strange times uh, edited by vinayak verma uh, which is you know uh, some of it's getting slotted under children's book on the publishers website uh, elsewhere but i would say that is for children of all ages and it actually features probably the first uh, indian sf story uh, which features aadhar It's, <laughs> yeah it's a story by zakoy and you know it's set in uh, uh, bangalore uh to come to uh, this year itself uh, we've had uh, lavanya lakshmi narayan's uh, analog virtual and other uh, simulations of your future which was uh, the first that was released in terms of uh, chronology you know just just before the pandemic started a nice uh, uh, you know sort of near future uh, dystopian if you can call it that uh, uh, bangalore which has been rebranded as apex city the whole thing is set in 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 bangalore and where the bell curve decides uh, everything and so you have the haves and the have nots and you know how sort of a, a world of constant surveillance and uh, all of that so that came out okay there you go krishna is our <laughs> official cover shower so that that's <laughs> yeah. i'm i'm sitting right next that's to all my books so <laughs> uh then there's another bangalorean called uh, uh, jay prakash satyamurthy who writes in a genre or a sub genre that isn't that often explored in india which is weird fiction so weird fiction and horror so his new uh, he just brought out his new collection called uh, uh come tomorrow and other tales of uh, bangalore terror so an old time bangaloreans will recognize <laughs> what what come tomorrow refers to it refers to the nale ba bhuta you know which had a lot of people in fear in the uh, you know uh, 90s you know this is a long time back so it, the title story is about the come tomorrow ghost and you know the whole bangalore mythos as he calls it there is a nice mix of uh, uh, weird fiction and uh, horror and Uh, his other book also came out this year, which is called Strength of Water, which is a small uh, uh, no, uh, novelette, or a, I mean, it's slightly bigger than a short story, smaller than a novel. I don't know, call it novelette or novellum, or I don't know, whatever, whatever the <laughs> category for that is. Uh, so yeah, so uh, then uh, just recently uh, uh, there was a bilingual anthology which was released called Avatar. it is uh, you know uh, the first italian uh, english anthology of indian sf which was published a uh, lot of original stories by uh, anil menon and 
SBDVR and all of those, which was published, uh, edited by Francesco Verso and Tarun Saint, who's the editor of the Golan's uh, SASF uh, series. Uh, of course, I, it would be remiss if we didn't mention the biggest SF release of the year, which is Samit Basu's Chosen Spirits. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, it just sort of climbed up the chart, was a, was a bestseller. Krishna will now show the cover, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, oh, wait, 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 I, I have it here somewhere. It's, yeah, it's there, it's there somewhere. It's, it's there in that pile that you see behind. Um, you know, uh, near future, set 10 years, uh, not just set 10 years into the future, which talks about, and uh, if you go by Chosen Spirits, we are currently living in the years that shall not be named. So, you know, it yeah. sort of feels strangely familiar, but not, uh, but it's not dystopian. I mean, Samit Dasu calls it anti-dystopian in the sense that yeah. however bad it gets in the book, that's perhaps the best best case scenario as he sees it. And in a uh, in perhaps what's a good recognition of uh, uh, SF being recognized? I mean, you usually when you talk about, you know, literary awards, quote unquote, and not your Hugo's or Nebula's, which are meant for genre, uh, they usually ignore this side, uh, uh, you know, this genre. I mean, for me, science fiction is as valid a genre uh, as literary fiction. Uh, and, and that's been a long standing grouse, but uh, Chosen Spirits made it to the long list of the JCB prize, which is, you know, the biggest in terms of uh, the prize money uh, for uh, a, a book uh, award in India. So that, that's, you know, sort of a nice high point uh, that's uh, recently happened. So this is as, and what I'm talking about are the books that have just been sort of trad pumped in English, right? Beyond this, yeah. if, you, if you sort of, scratch the surface and go beneath it, there's a whole lot of good self-pub books. I mean, Sturgeon's Law applies there also, right? But that 10% that of the self-pub books, uh, and I've come across a few, they're, they're quite nice, right? Uh, it's all, uh, I mean, suffers from the usual issues of uh, non-editorial oversight and all of that, but, you know, they, they, they're so good. Uh, and also, uh, what I'm not mentioning is the whole wealth of uh, SF being written in regional uh, languages. Uh, Bengal, uh, you know, has a huge tradition of SF and they even have probably one of the only active SF only magazines called Kalpa Biswa, which is very active and they do translations and, you know, they have their own stalls and bookstores. Uh, Marathi's uh, ha has uh, this thing. So, it, given all of this, uh, the uh, you know the profile of Indian SF has been lifted, um, and to just close it a bit because I think people are getting impatient to talk about Gautam and the Wall. Uh, uh, the people uh, like uh, Shiv Ram Das or Nibedita Sen, uh, Mimi Model, who are getting nominated for the Hugos and the Nebulas, have sort of made even the Western publishers and readers sort of take note of uh, Indian SF. So, uh, which brings me to the point that you made the wall couldn't have come at a better time. Uh, also, because it's a different kind of SF. I mean, it's yeah. not uh, science fiction. It's not clearly fantasy, but sort of drops somewhere in the middle of what you know people would call slipstream, right? And it's it's sort of uh, different in the sense that it's. Something like this is not being published in India, you know, in, with this kind of subject matter and this sort of this kind of ideas heavy book. So, yeah, yeah. that's my brief bio or <laughs> brief background of <laughs> the resurgence of Indian SF. Krishna, do you have anything to add to that? No, I'm just going to say the wall is a bloody good book and let's start talking about it. All right. Besides, I can't talk Shenoy uh, when it comes to <laughs> talking about the field. So that's it. Krishna, let's uh, talk to you about uh, the wall. Um, so the thing is that uh, talking about uh, this genre of writing, I mean, Ursula K. Le Guin in her note to the left hand of darkness has written about how science fiction is uh, not prescript, uh, is not uh, predictive as much as it is uh, descriptive. Yeah. And uh, you know how it's like a thought experiment. So uh, she says that the truth is a matter of the imagination. Now the wall, like uh, Shanoi said, doesn't exactly fit into any one genre of 
uh, this is, it's not exactly science fiction, it's not exactly fantasy, but it fits into the broader umbrella of speculative fiction and it has that thought experiment element uh, to it. So I'd like to know what you think is the um, thought experiment that is being done in the wall and what truths you think it is bringing to the fore. Wow, deep question. Um, I think in, in that sense, you know, uh, speaking to what Shinoi said, both about the resurgence of Indian sci-fi as well as uh, where the wall fits in. Um, it, it, it's true what you're saying that, you know, the best speculative fiction is actually a mirror to reality. And in that sense, the wall has so many little things and big things I resonated with and, um, you know, completely was like, oh my God, this is so here and now. Um, the whole notion of, you know, I mean, uh, at least this is what I took away from it, you know, as a, a book is both what the writer intends and what the reader also takes away in that sense. So uh, to, to me, it was this whole question of, you know, the, 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 there were so many levels of it. There was the individual quest for something more, the whole quest for freedom to be juxtaposed against the need for societal balance and to what degree societal balances have to be um, traded off with societal inequalities um, so, you know, one could get into the broader issues like that. One, one, one could see reflections of the caste system. Um, and I mean, I don't know, what, I actually want to ask Gautam whether he intended this, the blue revolution. I love that, man. Is it what I think it is? If you're asking specifically about the blue revolution and the etymology of that. Um, mm -hmm. So actually it's, it's, uh, that does not have a specific link, um, link with, with, I think anything in, in our world, in our contemporary world, but it actually speaks to the the um, difficulties of of world building when you have mm. a semi closed system like in like in the wall, uh, because you have the system where you have this very high wall, nobody's gone beyond it. So you have to within that, what are the resources that need to exist um, for people to be able to survive? Um, have to all be self contained, right? So renewable and and so on. So one of one of the key questions that I was facing um, was in this kind of a closed system, what might status symbols look like? Mm -hmm. uh, because every human society needs those kinds of symbols. Um, and I remember that in history, blue paint was always something that, that symbolized the power of the patron of that painter because blue paint was so hard mm. to, to source. Um, you know, Vermeer and so on, all these painters. Um, and so that set me thinking and I found that there was a specific self-pollinating flower called the wood, the wood plant that was historically a source of, of blue paint. Um, and self-pollination was important because in this world, because there are no animals, there are no bees, so there can't be pollination in the normal course of things. So you had to have something that was self-pollinating. Wood was self-pollinating, wood was the source of blue color. And so that allowed a limited amount of blue pigment to become the status symbol in that world. And from there, the blue revolution that tried to equalize all of that. So it, it was basically the imperatives of, of, of rigorous world building that were woven into the actual story that together made, you know, the, the blue revolution as a concept in that story. Uh, but it was mostly a product of just having to really think about, about world building, which I think is a central feature of, of you know, science fiction, spec fic, mm -hmm. wherever you go. You know, I, th I think it actually goes to the depth or the uh, fundamental truths of your world building that, you know, you come at it from one day and it still finds so much resonance in something else that you may not have intended altogether. And I think that actually speaks to the strength of it, the fundamental truths, because the moment I, I was like blue and blue revolution, I was like, Jai Bhim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it was like... Yeah. Two, two two days ago, two days ago, in a, in a in a socially distanced picnic, someone said, "Wasn't isn't isn't like isn't the blue revolution JB?" And I said, "Well, now that you say it, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to deny it, but no, my my thought process was something far more mundane and and rooted in like the necessity of of putting a coherent world together." So yeah. No, but yeah, like I said, I think that just speaks to the fundamental strengths of the world that you've created. Yeah. That it resonates with so many other things as well. Yeah, unintentional, but but I'm glad that, that it's happened. Where you go? <laughs> I mean, the the author may be speaking to us, but the author is dead too. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
It's a good yeah. classic example of that happening here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like, let, let's forget Gautam wrote the book. Now we're just going to discuss the book. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I thought so too, that there are so many things, uh, Krishna, like you say, that resonate into what is already happening in our world. And like, if you, like if Gautam hadn't, Told us, even I would have thought that you know the blue revolution is uh, related to uh, the uh, you know caste struggles and things like, and that does show up a lot actually. I, mm -hmm. I thought the concept of that social law, and uh, you know the uh, that that was amazing. Like I was like this this is just really radical and it's awesome. But yeah, okay, moving on. Um, now that Gautam is back, um, Gautam, my question to you. Now, there has been a lot of focus in uh, recent years about, uh, you know, the issues of representation and inclusion in, um, uh, you know, popular culture, especially in books as well. And there is a lot of push, especially for own voices uh, narratives. Now, given that context, uh, did you have any doubts at all about uh, writing a, a main character who was a queer woman? Yeah, that's that's a very very good question, and I you know, divide that I think into into two parts. Um, the first is the choice is the choice uh, you know uh, to do that, and the second is the the actual writing of it. I think that the uh, the issues that kind of arise are different um, in both. The first is the actual actual choice um, to uh, for the protagonist to be a queer woman. Um, I think that Rick Riordan basically he put this really well, and and um, he what he said was that look the world's a diverse place, right? Um, so far what's happened is that the writing has acted as if it's not, uh, right? And, and, and this is why uh, the protagonists of, you know, classic canon, science fiction canon, all these years, subject to, of course, there's always, always been a pushback, but um, what, what is now, what has come down to is a dominant canon, right? Has actually pretended as if the world was much narrower than it is, uh, which is why you have, you know, cisgendered, predominantly white men with, with white names, always playing the protagonist roles, you know, entrenching of gender binary, all of that, right? Um, and, and, and what Rick Riordan says is that's a much poorer view of the world uh, because th that is actually what, what should be taken as, as being, you know, um, uncharacteristic because that is not what the actual world looks like. Um, and if you actually examine what, what the real world looks like, um, then, a, a narrative um, that is closer to the fullness of its diversity is actually being truer to the real world um, uh, th than than the canon, which which acts as if the, you know half of or so much of it doesn't even exist. So I think that in in that sense, um, it's just a question. It's not even trying to be consciously representative or, or trying to achieve a represent a goal of representation. But just to acknowledge that, that this is how diverse the world is and your novel should reflect that diversity. Uh, so that's on, on the issue of, of the choice of, of uh, you know, uh, um, of making the, not making the, part of it was driven by the narrative concerns, but the protagonist being a queer woman. Um, the second issue, and I think here is where a lot of concerns come up, is the writing of it, right? Because the fact is that the way our world has shaped up, there are axes of privilege. Um, those axes of privilege have shaped experiences um, in very specific ways. And so even though we may want to, to live in a world in which gender is not salient, that's not the world we live in. Um, and therefore, it, it follows that as a cisgender heterosexual man, there are experiences along those axes that I don't have access to. Um, and, and therefore, and, and, and the kind of solution partial unsatisfactory but it is what it is devised and, and i don't know if this goes beyond science fiction but it, it's it's a, it's it's very big in science fiction is the idea of sensitivity reading uh, which is that when you have you know when you have narratives that involve characters whose lives are shaped on axes of privilege that you do not share then you ensure that what you're writing is read um, by individuals who do share those the axes. Um, and therefore, to the extent that you are engaging in, say, uh, objectification, appropriation, or are just being pure tone deaf, um, you are told that in no uncertain terms. And then you are 
guided about what is going wrong. Um, so that's what that's what, that's what uh, that's the process the wall went through um, in in trying to ensure that that in the writing of those characters, um, th th there was to the extent it is possible to do so uh, to avoid um, it coming across or being appropriative, um, you know, or or just plain inaccurate or wrong. To the extent that it has succeeded or failed, of course, is something that 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 readers. Um, we will tell me, uh, but but that's that. Yeah, that is the two-part answer to to this question. Okay, okay. I I actually would like to comment on the success of it. Uh, you know, because I I mean I can't comment on uh, the uh, uh, representation of uh, queerness because I don't have the lived experience to judge that. But as a woman, I found you know a lot of these little little things that were very uh, relatable. Uh, and uh, you know, there's one particular incident that uh, really quite struck me from the book, where, uh, and I'll keep this vague to not make it a spoiler, which is that there is one woman who's going off on an adventure, and then another woman hands her a packet, uh, you know, consisting of uh, food, water, and most importantly, sanitary napkins. And she says that you know you need to have this with you because you don't know where you're going and what's going to happen. And so, uh, you know, and that struck me because there's such a conspiracy of silence uh, in our culture about talking about menstruation. So that when I saw it, I myself did a double take, like, you know, am I reading what I'm reading? And then it was a very nice moment. And it's also the kind of thing that, uh, you know, women do for each other on such a regular basis. It's a nice moments of uh, sisterhood and it was very uh, relatable. So I, I really... I just said that that, that that specific that specific those specific three lines went through four drafts um, before before it was finalized and and, um, and 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 it was read by multiple people to kind of um, just those three lines specifically. So wow. uh, yeah, that, that's a, uh, it, I, I was I was terrified about getting getting that wrong and and and, and even now I, I still am. So so um, <laughs> but, but I think you said like uh, it, the benefit here is of having people who will tell you very bluntly you're getting it wrong. Um, there was one scene that I, in, in the comments, uh, some, one of my readers, you know, said that this scene reads like a straight man is writing it. Uh, so it, it really makes you feel like very small when you read that comment, but then you can go back to the drawing board and redo it. So, and, and in the end, it's better for it. So, so yeah. I think this is a great, great thing that science fiction is kind of like, you know, this idea of sensitivity reads and making sure that, that um, it's blunt and, and clear the feedback to you. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think those sensitivity TDs worked here quite a bit. So I, I will tell, I will tell, I will tell them. I can't speak for all women, but definitely worked for me. Yeah. No, but it's also credit to the larger story. I mean, how that, that whole relationship to me, I mean, you know, was sort of weaved in and, you know, was part of, uh, you know, uh, Sumer's uh, system and, you know, Sumer's, uh, you know, it, it didn't feel out of place. So, Credit to you there, uh, Gautam. Yeah, again, I mean, this is, I, I'm glad you, you brought this up because um, this was a, a big debate I had with, 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 with the person who, you know, really had a, a big role in, in the shape of, of this novel. Uh, and, and my point was that, look, the gender roles and so on are, are, are products of specific material conditions. Um, and so one thing that the book is trying to explore is that if, the, if those material conditions are not present. So in this case, there's no question of like tra people traveling long distances, you know, or, or like physical strength being like, you know, just a determining factor in your, in what you can, you know, do and a host of other such conditions. And you, these kinds of, of roles would never arise. And so gender would not be salient in that sense that it, it won't exist in the same way. Um, and, and, um, and this person said that is correct at the same time you you can't presume that that um, that that the, the you're still writing in the world, um, even though the world you're writing you know is a different one. So therefore, you have to ha kind of treat this fine balance of 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 okay, yes, given the state of of the world you're creating, gender will occupy a different kind of a space, but you at the same time can't be ignorant of the salience it has in your world. Um, and that treading of the line was was one of the big challenges, um, you know, uh, that that I faced and continue to face as I work on the sequel. 
I mean, that's I mean, to me that, that bit also because you said material requirement and you know the the conditions that make you know keep the balance in uh, uh, Sumer given that they can't go beyond the wall and I think can come in beyond the wall and think of population and why it is you know then it's called a pure union. Yeah. Right. That, that to me yeah. was a great thought experiment in terms of world building to. You know, what, okay. How much of this is material requirement? What happens? You know, when these uh, material uh, restrictions don't arise, so you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a good thought experiment. So in that sense, you know, part two couldn't come sooner. <laughs> I agree. Seriously, seriously. Like the moment I closed the book, I was yeah. like, I need the sequel now. Like right now, I need to know. Some in some in, some in, in any, uh, uh, any idea? Got them any predictions on when that's going to be out? Oh yeah, no, no. It, it, it's so I'm, I'm. I, the draft is done. I'm in. I'm in edits right now. Uh, wow. Uh, it, it'll uh, it, it'll take about two and a half, three months more to, to finish, finish, and, and hand it over to the editor, and it'll be out middle of next year, like like this one. So, so lovely, that, lovely. Normal, normal sequence where one one year and then the year after. So so, it, but it, it, the, the draft is done. Uh, I know how the story ends, <laughs> and and I'm in the present so I'm process of editing it right now. So yeah. No, what does one have to do for sneak peek at draft just to figure out the story how it goes? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, how I mean, are you are you corruptible? Easily corruptible? We can, we can, we can, we can, we can discuss that offline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but at, at, at this point, I think we should also tell all the people who are participating that listen, don't. It may be a nice thing. We are impatient, but don't wait for the book second book to come out to pick up this one. Yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You will anyway want to read this book multiple times. So by the time you know you finish doing that and you've like digested it and caught all the uh, innuendos and all the lovely detailing in it, yeah, then yes. it will be just right time for you to get to book two. So no, 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 start now if you want to be out, thank and, you, you know, you. fully yes. there in time Absolutely. for book two. Absolutely, because the there's so much to think about. Yeah, no, and given the fact that it's so ideas heavy and you know the way it uses the sort of Socratic method to arrive at you know so many things. You know, <laughs> it's like in a, a bit like a Christopher Nolan film. You know, it only makes sense the second time you watch. There are many Easter eggs scattered all over the all over the book and uh, exactly. Yeah, so so yes. on, you know, on your second run, once you sort of done and digested and formed your own opinions, and then you go back to sort of cross check. Okay, take take no take no take no take. <laughs> <laughs> like, like 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 they say, you know. Yeah, uh, you know, no man can cross a river twice. Never twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, yeah. the the person has changed and the river is different. It's it's a it's it's a bit like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 True. It is. It is quite a deep book. Uh, actually, I think now is a great time to get to the readings. So, uh, and okay, usually it is the author who reads from their own work, but. Um, I have learned from experience and from a trick from my friends that it's very nice for the author to listen to their work being read out. So what we're going to do is that Krishna and uh, Shanoi are going to pick up uh, some excerpts from the wall and read that uh, out. And also tell us why they picked that particular expert. Like why did that uh, excerpt, why that uh, resonated with them so much. Uh, Krishna, can you begin with you? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be reading from, well, not about middle, one third of the book. And um, let me read this first and then I'll talk about it. Because <laughs> yep. I, I actually I had a tough time choosing. I, I had three narrowed down and then I decided this has to be the one. So uh, the, the chapter is called A Voice in the Dark 2. And what of the dreamers themselves? What about their lives, their own stories, their loves and their longings? What brought them to the fireside and bound them there? Smara, of course, in part. But Smara can't be the entire explanation. There was something else. And I think I know what it was for each of them. But it wouldn't be appropriate to dwell on, dwell on Garuda and Dhara, would it? The one inspired, the other brooded, but history seems to have blotted them from its pages. Mithila then the younger sister, the one who remained behind with Garuda gone, the one who always longed to be like Garuda, but could never quite manage it, the one who never stopped blaming herself for what happened. You know, I remember playing a game with Mithila once. We were imitating a style of conversation we found in the pages of the philosopher Temur, 
to get at the truth. One of the conversationalists played the role of a questioner and the other answered. The questions had to be asked as swiftly as possible and the answers had to be instinctive, unplanned. To cut a long story short, I was the questioner and because it was Mithila, naturally the theme was the war. I put to her all the reasons that one could have for wanting to breach the wall. Was it for glory? No, she said. Did she dislike the people of Sumer? No. Did she want gain, resources, power and control? No, no, no. Why then, I asked finally, did she want to breach the wall? In three words or less, Nicola, I said. Because it exists. Because it exists. That was all. That was Mithila. She couldn't give you a coherent reason for why she was doing what she was doing. Why, despite what happened in the pit, she fought and succeeded in keeping the group together, carrying on, carrying on after Dara, carrying on in the teeth of the Shorten's enmity, the elders' hostility and the select's indifference. You would have stubborn re reasons to account for such intransigence, such suicidal stubbornness, wouldn't you? No. Not for Mithila. As long as the wall existed, she was driven by this discontent she couldn't identify, by a restlessness that she couldn't name, by the fire that burned within and burned her up, but a fire she could not ignite in others. She didn't have the words or the song, but she had it all inside her. Yeah. Um, and I chose this because you know, it's, it's, this is one of those, uh, most of the scenes had Mithila in them all the time. Um, and this was this one scene where it's almost like looking outside in at her. And it's, it's, it's a sudden, uh, different less level of resonance it gives with this character as well as why she's doing. Because I, I, I went through that and, and that's what I, what, the one thing I really liked about this book was the character arcs. There are times when I've actually been pissed with her. They're like, what are you mm -hmm. doing, woman? You know, are you, are, you, are you like mad? This is not done. And her sister says that to her a lot in the book. And are you mad? And like, seriously, are you mad? Are you stupid? Can't you see what's going on? I mean, I can figure that out. And I'm just, I'm just reading this book kind of thing. But to me, that speaks to how invested I was in her and in the other characters and in the story. So this particular passage, it was almost like, um, it was almost making sense of Mithila to me. It was almost like, you know, someone was trying to get my head in place about this character where, uh, you know, and then that's it. After that, it's like, I'm completely, I mean, till then I was really, really interested in her, but by then I was like totally invested in her. And um, I love that. It's, it's actually, uh, I stopped halfway. It actually goes on to describe two more characters uh, in the core team, so to say. And I think uh, those differences are also brought out uh, very beautifully, each of their nuances and how they come. But just keeping an eye on the time, I'm going to stop here and make it a short piece, if that's okay. Now, I agree with you, Krishna. I mean, um, I loved uh, that particular passage. Actually, I loved all of those uh, voice in the <laughs> dance. I kept looking yeah. forward to them. Because, and you know, they, they kind like of turn the camera around and show uh -huh. us from somebody else's point of view. And they, they, that, those are just amazing. Um, yeah, and, and, yeah. and then Gautam has this smug smile on his face which says, I know who that is and you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and you can be grateful for social distancing so that you're not actually getting punched. <laughs> or, or maybe that, that says, you know, I have the reader exactly where I want them. <laughs> No, Gautam, as a reader, can I just say, I almost hate you. <laughs> I mean, I love you, but I hate you, if you know what I mean. I mean, like, hate you for leaving me hanging this way. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I guess, I guess that's, 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 that's what it also loves to hear, actually. Um, and, um, but no, I'm, I'm I, I think that it, it's really interesting you brought this up because um, one of the things that, that I wanted to um, really ensure with, in, in the story was that uh, Mithila's opponents should have arguments that are at least as good as hers. Um, mm. And so one should never really be quite sure whose side one is on in that sense. I mean, 
of course, there is a protagonist, and in that sense, like her story is is the story. Uh, but I think that that um, that one thing that that um, I think the old canon did a little too easily was um, was give us answers about what is, is who is in the right and who is in the wrong. Um, I just felt that that it was important to 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 say that that uh, actual life is 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 much is much is much messier, um, and so she has her reasons to want to go beyond the wall. But there are reasons not to, and and it's not that her opponents are caricatures or villains or, or cartoons. You know, I mean, they have convictions, um, and so there are times when she would, if if a reader feels that she's actually being being an idiot or like you know, then that's actually good. Like the, it, it, that's it's a good response because um, part of it is that 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 you know um, this is not a choice that is meant to be clear cut at any point. Yeah, and her opponents are not all bad people. You know, it's not like you set yeah. out hating them. You actually, I, I I kind of like some of them, and I kind of found them really classy and so even I'm like, you know what? Maybe you just might be right. I mean, why is this girl so insistent yeah. on doing this? So that. That that conflict is something I think that's come across very clearly. So yeah, well done on that. That's beautiful. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad of that. If that if that worked, yeah. Thanks. It did most certainly. Shanoi, uh, would you like to do your reading now? Uh, yeah. Uh... A bit Sorry, of one second. Can, I just, can I just say one second for that? I see the question, and I'm so glad because someone's finally spotted that. Uh, there is a conversation in the book that matches Tears in the Rain from Blade Runner. Is that an Easter egg? Yes, yes, and and that's the first person who has like, I think, said this spotted a Blade Runner reference, and that that was one of my uh, things closest to my heart. So I'm so so I'm like I'm really happy that someone has spotted the Blade Runner reference. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I spotted Tolkien reference. Did it there are many. There are many. There are many of the. I know. It's like. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, after uh, part two is over some, you know, we should just bring out the annotated wall. <laughs> I know, <laughs> it's like full of <laughs> yes. <this> thing. Yes. <laughs> and also, I think that, I don't know if we've had uh, something like this in India before where, you know, fans are discussing Easter eggs and fan theories and stuff <laughs> like that. I don't know if we've had a book like that before, but I think this is awesome yeah. because I, I just really love it. I mean, and, that just and, and, through the depth of the world building and the, the, the detailing in the, the sort of writing, especially when he spoke of the Blue Revolution and the boards and stuff like that. It's a sort of nice insight into how an author does world building. You know, it's like the half the things don't make it to the page. Right. right. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And am I over-reading or overseeing the uh, the possibility of an Asimov reference in there too? Um, there, there, there is, there, there are, there are some of references. Uh, in which will, which in will fact, become, the voice in the darks. Uh, no, so the, the voice in the dark is not an Asimov uh, reference. Okay. Um, because so, so I got the idea from the voice in the dark from uh, My Name Is Red. Uh, where, ah, okay. Like, mm. Yeah. So, so, so where every chapter was like a different perspective and kind of was looking out onto the story. Uh, so one chapter would be I am your uncle. Second chapter would be like I am so and so. So so, mm. so that that um, uh, uh, so that the voice in the dark series was was basically inspired by my name is Red. Uh, okay. There are some references, but but they will they will become clearer in book two. So I want to just hold off on that for now. So yeah. And there are Leguin references also. I well, well, Le Leguin is 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 yeah. <laughs> There's so many. We, we should tick them off all one by one. Maybe. Yeah. Next yeah. We'll have a competition. Who spotted maximum uh, <laughs> Easter eggs and references? Yeah. And the reader will get to get advanced copy of part two. No, I think the <laughs> So sorry, Shanoi, I was interrupted. You sorry. No, 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 she's, no, she's. Right. Uh, so my reading. No, I. The, okay, there are just a bit of a preamble before that. Uh, so there, there. There are two kinds of authors, right? Uh, one is the uh, Tolkien, this thing was, you know, when, you know, who went to death saying, "No, Lord of the Rings is not an allegory or a metaphor for, uh, uh, you know, World War One. It's not an allegory. It's not a metaphor. It just is." Then there's the other kind of author, like a uh, C.S. Lewis, who's like, "If you do not get the fact that that big lion is Jesus, I will kill myself." <laughs> Right? So, Arslan is the metaphor for Jesus. You know, uh, I agree for that. So, I don't know which uh, of these uh, uh, Gautam falls into, but to me, the wall <laughs> sort of stood as a metaphor for the sort of, you know, 
gradual losing of things you know the you know one by one you lose a few things uh, you know and you're only left with sort of memories uh, you know of them and the sort of living with the loss becomes the new normal right i mean if you take the wall as you know as the box that you've been put into and it's shrinking further and further so in, in that sense the 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 concept of smara to me in the book i mean these people are living in their mandala hierarchies and you know uh, uh, as much as they would like to think that it's all hunky dory you know things are bubbling to the surface right people are wanting to go out and how the thing of uh, uh, this smara the concept of smara uh, you know drives not just mithila but appeals to a lot of people uh, and the thing i mean to those who have read the book uh, this is for you uh, so uh, one is by uh, this extract is an epigraph from uh, uh, before uh, chapter 1 of uh, part 1 and it's about this concept called smara the passage of time drove us to accept the wall among the natural order of things after all we had no choice and yet there were moments as children we had dreams dreams in which we saw things we could not name or understand we knew on, we only knew they existed existed beyond the wall as we grew these dreams and the memories began to fade the vanishing marked a passage into adulthood or so we were told but they never disappeared entirely something was left behind a longing that remained with us every waking moment some days it was too much then we went to the wall looked up at the sky and beat our fists against that smooth black thing caged we wept smara they called it the yearning the yearning for a world without the wall now this is an extract by taraf uh, who's uh, one of the people mentioned and it's from his book called unchained history so smara is this sense is yearning but then we come to the other side of the you know divide uh, which is the sort of the antagonist shurtans who say you know this is the one true book and this the book is the black book and this is an extract from the black book and this also talks about smara for malan's transgression the wall of sumer came to be and we who had betrayed the builder's trust were condemned to praya the penance on this side of the wall but it was not enough for the wall to exist because we humans are forgetful and so the builders gave us smara an ache that we carry within us from birth to death an ache that recalls all that we had and all that we lost with the transgression capital t when the circle of time is complete when the penance is over penance is over and when the wall crumbles to dust that day smara too will vanish like the moon at wall rise until then it is a burden to bear so the same concept of smara is in one sense yearning in on, on the other it's a burden mithila gives it her own meaning which i will not say for uh, you know uh, spoiling the book but i loved how the same thing you know means so many different things to so many different people and how the same concept can be sort of you know if you can say weaponized to oppress or be a liberating force depending on which side of the fence and how you interpret it you know so that's that's why i chose it so you know if gautam can shed more light about smara i mean it's sort of one of those untranslatable words perhaps like the portuguese saudade you know so like it's nostalgia it's yearning it's it's a lot many things you know and you, you got to feel it was was that the intention i mean it, given that it's one of the fundamental concepts and driving forces of the protagonists yeah i mean that's exactly right and and um, so language has been something that has fascinated me for years and years and um and uh, in sense of of the relationship between language and the world how language constructs the world um you know and and how the world acts upon language all of those questions so of course and i i and so when i was again world building one of the fundamental things was that okay first of all when you have this wall and you never been beyond that your language will be cramped and and you know there are there are things you wouldn't have words for um because there are things that you never you never seen and so your your language itself would be like much spare much more austere uh, you know and it and it's kind of constricted um, that's one thing the second is that that you would have certain kinds of 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 feelings um that specifically are drawn from the fact that you are surrounded by a wall and never been beyond that 
and you would need to have different words uh, to describe them. Uh, and so Smara comes in as this, you know, in the beginning as this, this feeling of longing that you have when you spend all your life surrounded by the wall, you know, um, there's a specific unique feeling that gives you that nobody else would have if they weren't in that condition. Um, so, so that was where the idea of it came from. And of course, the second thing was therefore that there will be a constant battle over words like this. When you have these words that are the organizing principles of your existence, then there's a constant battle over what they mean and are they, you know, are they good? Are they bad? Is, is Smara a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is something that you are meant to overcome? Or something that you know you're meant to to live in because you're paying a penance for something you know in again in the book there are theories that people are paying a penance for the crimes of their ancestors which is why they're they're within this wall and smara is kind of a reminder of those crimes right so 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 people who want to keep everyone within the wall would try to give a meaning to smara that would justify or this that 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 outcome because this is a feeling everybody has the question is what do you do with that and the language you use for it and the meaning you give to it would, would depend on what you do with that. And so there is, so part of the, one of the main themes of the book is a struggle over language uh, and the struggle to define what these, these concepts mean uh, and thereby to, to justify the wall continuing to exist, sort of justify attempts to go beyond it, which finally, you know, kind of play out in the question of, are you allowed to do this? Are you not allowed to do this? And so on. So I think at, at, at the heart of it, and you're right, um, loss is, is a fundamental, you know, uh, running theme. That combined with this battle over language and how it shapes our perceptions of the world was central to this conceptualizing of, of the idea of Smara. I mean, I mean, what I also like is how, how language sort of plays a, a role in the war. I mean, it's like like you said, you know, that what you call linguistic relativity or the Sapirov yeah. uh, hypothesis. Yeah. You no, know, I mean, at, at its most fundamental thing, it's like it says so, you know, right here. Like, imagine a horizon. I can't. Because they, they don't, you know, they don't, haven't seen a horizon. They don't know what a horizon is. You know, and the way they struggle to give, you know, try to figure out what a horizon is and, you know, and all these little, all, all those words. So that to me was also fascinating, you know, in terms of the, the world building of the wall. Yeah, Sapir Worf is good you worth it up because that was one of my earliest fascinations. And I, I realize now that that um, that, uh, that theory is, is probably wrong. Uh, but there, there is a fantastic book called The Language Game. Uh, no, no, not The Language Game, sorry. Uh, Through the Language Glass uh, by, by Guy Dusher. And he begins with this, uh, this famous example of the Greeks um, who had who had a Homer's Iliad had a phrase called the wine dark sea, um, and and he says that look whatever else the sea looks like, the color of wine is not what it looks like. So how is Homer saying the wine dark sea? Like what is the connection between the sea's color and 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 wine? Wine. And then Dusha goes on to explain that in your color spectrum, if you if you named colors differently and and divide the spectrum differently, you can see how the sea's color and wine are on the same spectral line. Uh, if you just classify it, the spectrum differently, uh, and I and book is amazing, and I would recommend that. But this whole sense of of language is a way of categorizing the world, and then as an impact on how you see it and understand it, uh, it was something that that is just like one of the fundamental basic ideas un underlying this book as well. And 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 you'll see it in in book two. There's going to be a lot more of that. Uh, yeah. Okay, he's just making us more impatient. <laughs> <laughs> Everything with in book two, in book two, and I'm like, this is not done. This is not fair. Yeah. I Sorry protest. Yeah. I protest. Absolutely. Yeah. Any, I think, I think we're uh, kind of uh, getting close to the end uh, of our time. So before we get into the audience uh, Q and A, because I'm sure they're impatient, I just have one more question that I'd like all of you to weigh in on. Uh, which is that uh, Gautam spoke at the beginning about the need for uh, infrastructure uh, to, you know, kind of build up uh, Indian SFF. So coming back to that a bit, um, what do you think is the future for Indian SFF? And uh, what infrastructure do you think we need, uh, you know, not just to uh, encourage new readers to pick up books, but also to encourage upcoming writers and uh, you know more diverse voices from within india into the field hello ah, 
<laughs> I was not sure if I was being heard. <laughs> Shall we do this in all alphabetical order of last name? Um, anyone who wants to start. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I guess I can, I can, since nobody else, I can, I can briefly go first on this. Um, um, yeah, I mean, so uh, honestly, the, the experience I've had working with Strange Horizons, the magazine for the last four years, um, and, and publishing this book in India, is that essential to all of this is a, is a community, a community of readers, a community of writers, a community of editors. Um, com for, for community to form, you need spaces. Uh, these spaces can take different forms. They can be book clubs like this one. It's very important. They can be magazines like the Mithila, Mithila Review, uh, which is, I think, at this point, the only regular science fiction magazine run out, out of India. There can be cons, conventions, which are all the rage in the US and in, in the UK, but don't yet properly exist over here. All those become spaces where communities form. Uh, and, 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 that, and without that, it's not going to happen. So, so, that, so I think we need to build over time towards that kind of a, of a community uh, so that someone who thinks about writing, you know, is uh, someone who's interested in, in specfic. First of all, I mean, the, the journey I had, right? For, 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 since the age of 10, I was a fan. So I, I, spent, I spent 16 years, 16 years as, a, as a fan, four years as an, as an editor, and then now as a novelist. I think that's a very typical journey of a science fiction writer. You always begin as a fan. You spend many years as a fan. Then you, you become a writer. But when, you're, when you are a fan, you need to see how you can progress to becoming a writer if that is where your interests lie. I never saw that when I was a fan. It happened finally, but I never saw what the route was. Uh, and I think if you had this infrastructure as, as, a, as, a, as a young fan who dreams of becoming a writer, which I did, if you could see up the path, right, then you would be able to go, to go on that. And I think all of this is what would help create that, that path. Because still, I mean, honestly, still, um, my choice to publish with HarperCollins India was kind of like, in that sense, it, it, it was and is a risky choice. Because, you know, uh, the choices people normally make is to, is to publish with abroad. Because that's where you get an audience, ready-made audience. I wouldn't say there isn't an audience here, but there is like an existing audience over there. Um, and, and, and that's where you're expected to kind of make your name and then Indians will read you because you've gotten validation from the West, right? That, that's like, that's still, still the presumption. And, and I'm not saying it's wrong. I think there are like good reasons why, why people would do that. And I wouldn't judge anyone for doing that. That is what you need to do if you want to uh, you know, establish yourself. But I think that, that with all of this, we could, we could actually then write on our own terms, publish on our own terms, uh, and not have to look to that path of, of getting in from there and back um, uh, you know, uh, to become science fiction writers. I mean, okay, uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I'm going to speak about it from the non-path towards writer perspective, just as, as, as a reader. Uh, what I completely agree with Gautam when he said that we don't need to wait for validation from the West. A lot of us identify as SF fans and SF readers and it, almost everybody seems to take the same path in uh, right, uh, an Asimov uh, or a Clark or something like that. Great. I mean, whichever works for you. Some come in via, uh, you know, Le Guin and all of those uh, and Tolkien and all of Because primarily because when you walk into a, a bookstore, this is what sort of still greets you. Right. And of course, George R. R. Martin, most of them. But now that we have enough, it's also, I feel, upon us as uh, readers and as fans to speak about it. You know, to speak about the books that we love and to talk about it, you know, even if it means leaving a short review on a Goodreads or an Amazon or sharing it on a social media thing and talking about it uh, a lot. I mean, the minute, uh, you know, you get a hold of a Western novel, like, hey, I got this, you know, just support our Indian writers and in turn, you know, like, for example, if, if Chosen Spirits does really well, if The Wall does really well, then we'll have more and more books of that, right? It's a bit of a catch-22 situation. Right. Uh, the other thing also that we need is uh, a space in the official uh, literary events map, so to speak, uh, you know, which is where I think, uh, you know, I will give due credit to the Bangalore Literature Festival, who probably became the first literature, major literature festival, uh, you know, to say that, hey, listen, we're going to have a dedicated SF track. Right. So, I mean, that was a chance that they were taking. So in the first year, I mean, uh, Krishna was a panelist. Uh, uh, the first year they did, we had just like two uh, panels and 
you know, there was such, a, you know, the, when there is an avenue, people will come. And looking at the response, the next year we had almost six to seven different panels, including in the children's section with Vinayak Verma, you know, Yudhan Javi Jiratne, and all of these people came down from Sri Lanka. We had Ian McDonald coming down from Ireland. You know, it's sort of, uh, you know, we, we had Indra Pramidas, we had Sukanya, Venkat Raghu, and so, you know, the community just, just sort of forms that way. But beyond that, there's so much uh, this thing of online, and I have found from my uh, personal experience that when, when there is an avenue, people will sort of come, come, come together. Like for example, just last week, somebody was saying that, hey, with this TBG quiz, I think I found my gang and stuff like that. And some of them may go on to become authors and writers and all this sort of thing. But but at least we're starting to come together and we're starting to talk about it. So, you know, I, I, th th it, it falls on us as readers as well. Uh, okay. Uh... I, I actually, you know, totally resonate with and uh, uh, I should actually say, Gautam, thank you for doing that in terms of publishing in India, because I think that has been a very, very important thing to do. And it's, you know, it's a fact that many readers probably also don't realize that, you know, a, a lot of writers who are known as Indian SF writers abroad probably sell fewer copies than we think they do, but they are better known because we always like things that are coming from overseas, whether it's, you know, uh, I, I think we still have that attitude, especially because we relate Indian writing to not very great writing. So there's still this whole duality of either it's going to be very lit and, uh, you know, uh, of a completely different category altogether, or it's going to be very bad writing. And in between you have well-written, but very interesting books in the SFF realm and people just don't know where to categorize them. So I think, and, and that sort of ambiguity is something that is going to go away only if, you know, as Shinoi also said, not only do writers have to say we are going to publish in India first, this is our main market, but as Shinoi pointed out, where readers have to come out and they've got to, you know, be able to say, yeah, you know what, I'm reading this book, it's by an Indian author and hell, it's bloody good SF. And that validation, that thing that it's okay, you know, that you don't necessarily have to draw Asimov and Clark's name or Leguin's name when you say, I enjoy reading SF, has to become a thing. It's got to become okay to say, you know, I read this amazing book called The Wall. It's by this guy called Gautam Bhatia. And man, can that guy write? Yeah. So, you know, that, I think those conversations have to happen a lot more. And, um, you know, strangely enough, and... Uh, uh, just, just for my thoughts on what is actually going to give us this final fill-up, you're not, it's going to sound strange, but it's actually going to be Corona. Because in two ways, one, it's because people are going to be like, okay, these guys are not writing about weird things that we cannot relate to. This is your life. You can now relate to it. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing that is probably going to happen is we're going to see a lot more media, uh, visual media content coming out in the SFF realm simply because now social distancing means everybody's forced to sh uh, shoot with green screens. So suddenly there's like this huge demand for SFF uh, scripts of all kind. And I think that might suddenly make it the commercial turning point where this becomes, you know, a force to reckon with. I, I, I think as a craft point, we are already there. You know, we, we are there, we're pushing the envelope every day. I think the readers are already there. Now, it's just the question of what, how are these factors going to coalesce to make it a commercial turning point? And yeah. Right. That, that's quite insightful. Thank you, all of you. That was wonderful. I think, I think let's go to the audience uh, questions now. Um, Pradeep Mohandas has a question for Gautam. Uh, is Pradeep Mohandas here? Uh, can he unmute himself and ask? Or, uh, okay, I I'll just read out the question. Yeah, Pradeep from uh, YouTube, so you might want to read it out. Okay, okay. So Pradeep is asking, what is the role of Horizons in his life? Did Strange Horizons gig play any role in thinking of the role of Horizon, which inspired the story in the wall? Oh, the role of Horizons in, in my life. Yeah, in your oh, life, yeah. and did the, the idea of Horizons, uh, your work with uh, Strange Horizons inspired the idea of Horizons in the wall? All right, no. Uh, well, so the, answer, the second question is no, because um, the uh, the work on this book began 12 years ago. Uh, for various reasons, it was suspended many times, uh, and it finally got done right now. But but the book is much older than 
Strange Horizons in, in my, as a part of my life. Um, and I think it's a very happy coincidence that, that Strange Horizons, which is in many ways has shaped how I understand um, science fiction, also has Horizons and, and Horizons is a fundamental part of this book. Uh, but no, I mean, the, again, the, the answer is I think is much more internal to world building. Um, which is that uh, it's again about how language fascinates me and and just this sense that um, if you were living in this world which was surrounded by a wall, you know, on all sides and wherever you went, that you would get to the wall. Something that is we take for, for granted, which is the existence of a horizon as part of what it means to live in the world, is something that people in that world would just find it so difficult to imagine and just the the attempt to imagine that would itself be a bit like an act of liberation which is again something that happens in, in the book people keep trying to imagine what what it might how to visualize what horizon would be um and so it was a, that was the kind of driving force for making the horizon as a concept central to uh to to the wall and of course there are broader themes about discovering horizons, getting to the horizon, how the horizon keeps receding from you, even as you go towards it, right? There's this famous, from Virgil's Aeneid, you have that sense of that, that faraway shore that keeps receding, even as you sail towards it, so you never get to it. So the horizon again, you know, keeps receding as you go. So you never actually reach the horizon. So is the quest for the horizon actually an illusion? So there are all those, all those ideas that are, you know, which I think depends on, on how the reader receives them. But central to it was this struggle over language and, and, how to imagine those things and how to liberate yourselves by being able to imagine them, despite the constraints that are that are kind of around you. That's wonderful. Uh, there's a request from uh, one of the um, viewers. Uh, it's not a question really. It's uh, just that could you share a high, re high resolution map of Sumer? Because it's impossible to zoom into it on the Kindle copy, and I agree because I had this. Yeah, struggle. yeah, no, no, I've, 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 I've gotten this, this this comment from a number of people, and I've written to the publishers, and I, I wrote to them again right now, like literally five minutes ago, by when I saw this thing that took. I quoted the comment, not 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 the person who. I just quote. I said, look, this is a comment. This is what people have said. Many people have said, please can we sort this out? You know, um, yeah. I hope it's. I hope they find some way and. Just a high resolution map I could put on, you know, online would, would be fine. Yeah, that'll but, be great. Uh, that'll be great. So publishers can at times be, you know, it might yeah. it, it it takes some effort to get to get some things that you think are easy to get, but they're not. So yeah. Yeah, yeah I think they're always learning experience. He, he's he's saying this in his first fiction. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry? laughs> <laughs> publishers can be uh <laughs> I've seen you at a loss of loss of words. No, it's 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 like between pragmatism and diplomacy. It's like knowing of him, what we do, like ah, oh, he's searching my no way. Come on. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I, as I said like it's just I, what I found often. I guess I guess a little funny is that you think that this is something very obvious, right? Um, it should be the easiest thing in the world to get a high res map and just like put it up, but somehow there'll be like a copyright issue here, like a legal issue there and, and I'm not an IP lawyer so I don't even know what those issues are right but there'll be like a whole bunch of things that will require clearance from someone and then from somebody else um, and so and yeah I mean I've just found that that um, that the things that I thought would be very easy to manage somehow are not uh, because of, of the number of, of actors involved in the publishing world around those issues uh, so, so that yeah uh, but I hope it's possible to sort this out because maps are really fundamental to the genre <laughs> and I, I do yeah. think and I think my editor understands that so I hope that that, that that's that, that sorted out I mean as yeah. someone who it's, as someone who can only read physical copies I cannot bring myself to do ebooks but someone who thinks score one for physical books <laughs> <laughs> that's a yes, beautiful yes. looking book huh? seriously it's like I couldn't get the physical copy here. Like I could only get my hands on a Kindle really quick. Oh. That's what I did. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so anonymous question from YouTube. Are there any specific books that uh, you read? I think this is for you, Gautam. Any specific books that he read that he can share that provided insight into the lived experiences of transgender queer women, which helps you provide representation re respectfully? Right. I mean, so um, transgender, no. I mean, and and I've, I've not uh, in 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 that's an issue of representation that I I presently do not think I'm equipped to address. Um, and 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 that's not uh, in the book. And that's a, well, that's 
a, a lack of of the book and and but, but I, I i i felt i wasn't equipped to to address that yet and hopefully in the future i will be so so that so that's on on the issue of of, of transgender representation um, on the issue of of queer representation well i mean uh, i guess i mean that other life in the, in the law comes in at, at some point um and and uh, because of 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 engagement with um with with the law around um around this issue uh, books like covering by by kenji yoshino uh the history of of same sex love in uh, love in india book that he cited in 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 the court case things like that so there were there were books of that kind and and just like a lot of scholarly literature around around courses in law schools around um you know the legal frameworks of gender and sexuality so a number of 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 articles um in in um, in scholarly journals whose names i can i can send later on uh, but what i want to say is that that was secondary that was that was an understanding of theory um at best you could have a competent understanding of of queer theory so so that um uh, that is still not going to i think and and just reading about it is not going to um enable you i think to to do justice to uh, experience which is why for me the irreplaceable bit was sensitive sensitivity reads um and and that gave me the kind of feedback uh, that i think no article uh, no book could have get kept given me so so i, I would i would count sensitivity sense sensitivity reads um and my my friends and my my colleagues who read um specifically those portions and explained to me when they were accurate and when they weren't accurate representations of of their experiences um in being able to do whatever i finally did uh, that was the most important part by far wonderful thank you uh, pranavi has a question pranavi do you want to um... you know ask it yourself a question with reference to uh, mithila's name uh i think i think gautam's already answered that uh, okay he said it's because yeah so uh, okay. another question that i actually wanted to ask was uh, i i'm not sure if i remember this right but there's been a curious lack of fauna in the wall right i think you mentioned that as well yeah. so uh yeah can you i found that very interesting and i didn't recognize it up until you mentioned it now so why do you think that is as in within the world uh, within the rules of the world why was it so yeah i mean so so that 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 uh, is not a question i can answer right now <laughs> it would, oh it would be, it would, okay it would be a bit of a let's go hold off yeah, on that yeah. right now yeah Anybody? Okay, no. I was waiting to see if he says book two again. I I consciously avoided. Yeah, I was that. I was waiting for that. I was like, here it comes, here it comes. <laughs> um. Yeah, but but I mean, so what I can say is that um, that I think I think it is obvious. The city within the wall is a constructed system. It's not something that arises naturally. Um. And and I think what was also kind of clear from from the novel is that. human beings were provided exactly the right amount of resources in the right quantities yeah. to be able mm-hmm. to survive in a decent way you know not 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 like live hand to mouth to be able to have a comfortable life inside the wall given the physical constraints but every time you add something to the ecosystem you will need to add three or four more things to sustain that addition right so so it's basically that, that um if you have a specific animal then that animal will need to feed on 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 something you know we like need to eat something you like need to have that specific crop or or the other animal that exists and so on so the more you add um the more you will need to add to make it a functioning ecosystem and so i think the the challenge in in not my world building but within the context of the novel the world that was built the world that was somewhere um was that in that physical space that is limited what are the least amount of things you can you can put in to ensure that human beings can live um and and it, and to the extent was possible to do, to do that without without fauna it was done um it, again because fauna would need to have space and so and space is like a huge constraint right so so it's basically given the small space what is what are the minimum number of things you can put in to ensure that that life goes on uh, human life goes on and that was um what was put in finally 
uh, why that was so well as i said that is something that that uh, not now be answered <laughs> They're all vegetarians. He who shall not be named shall not be named. I tried wrangling some info about book too, but well. <laughs> yeah, they're, all, they're, all, they're all vegetarians. By, by, by default, they're all vegetarians. Yeah. Okay, Nemo has a question for Gautam, and this is from uh, YouTube. Uh, how did the book cover come about? And are you open to new designers for book too? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Nemo is someone I know because I, 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 that question is a very fam- question is a question I've heard very recently in a very specific way. But um, I don't think, uh, so, yeah, I, I wonder if Nemo is someone someone I know. Anyway, uh, the, the book cover, yeah, there was a cover designer. Uh, they asked me what I wanted to represent on on the cover, uh, so I I said, you know, I I give them a rough outline, and then they gave me some options, and this was the one that after consultation. Uh, I, I decided upon. Now uh, I know that the cover seems to have really polarized, polarized opinion. Um, there are some people uh, who have who think it's very good, and there are some people who detest it. Um, <laughs> uh, that, that there are people who have said that a more minimalistic cover would suit the book better, um, and and uh, and absolutely, and, and I kind of you know. Uh, I guess for book two, I would be thinking of something much more minimalist, and I have a sense of what I want for book two. Uh, but yeah, I'm definitely open to 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 uh, a completely different design that is actually, you know, more on the lines of cover of The Handmaid's Tale or or you know, things like those books where where I mean, there's like one core idea that is conveyed in the cover, and and it's you know that's it. It's not like it's not meant to be visually overwhelming, but just like very very spare. So I think that might suit the the mood maybe better, and so. So yeah, I'm, I'm I'm thinking about that, and and um, uh, and, and and someone did a, did a delicious rendition of of a possible cover on Instagram, which I just loved. So so um, yeah, yeah, I'm 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 really open to 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 that idea. And I'm totally in that minimalist camp. If you can make it happen, nothing like it. Yeah, yes. I think I, 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 see all the people whose judgment I really trust have gone down that route, and and you're the latest one. So so um, so I I think the 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 push for that is becoming overwhelming and, and difficult to to um, to avoid now. So yeah, that, it'll probably go down there too, I think. Wonderful. I'm in a minority, but I like, love the cover. <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 my mom likes it, so. Okay, I said it, I said it. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna pretend, uh, I'm not sure how to feel about that bit, so I'm gonna pretend I didn't hear it. <laughs> well, no, I, I trust my mom's judgment, so. In, ah, that, okay. in that sense, all right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just to clarify, my mom used to be a filmmaker, and and so like design is wow. something that is like really, really like something central to to her. And and she and she actually designed the cover of of the previous nonfiction book. So so yeah, in that sense, oh. yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. That's lovely. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions from the audience. So and we have actually run over time quite a bit. Right, so yeah. I think I think we'll uh, I think we'll close this uh, for now, and uh, yeah, and and until inside, I'm sure we'll be back soon with uh, something great because this has been fabulous. I really loved uh, this. Um, thank you to everyone who attended the uh, session today. I hope you all enjoyed it and that you will pick up a copy of the wall immediately. You know, don't wait for book two, please. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was this is wonderful. Thank you, Gautam. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Shanoi. It was really great uh, interacting with uh, all of you. This was wonderful. Um, thank you, Pranavi. Uh, we could not have curated this so well without all your contributions. Um, thank you, Zainab and Hasgeek for hosting us and getting us all together. Um, thank you also to Anand Philip. Pratiksha and the Bangalore uh, Sci-Fi Club for your support. Um, have a wonderful weekend, everyone. And and thanks to you, Vijay Lakshmi, for such a wonderful job of holding this whole thing together. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank Could you. have done it without Thank you. you so much. Recording the session and you know, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it was like.